Hi guys, today we're taking a look at the Canon Pelix. This particular Pelix is a QL. Um, this cost me $40 uh, on eBay with a 50mm f1.8 lens. Um, its value on eBay is between $25 and $125 depending on the day of the week and the condition. When these were new in 1965 they cost $540. This this particular one, the conditions fair. When uh, when this came, when this first came out, I thought this was the wave of things to come, the first camera ever to eliminate mirror bounce. It wasn't until 40 years later, when Sony introduced the Alpha series cameras, that see-through mirrors came into wide use. I wanted one of these real bad, but couldn't afford it at the time. I also wanted a Leica more. But it's a beautiful little camera. Its historical significance is in 1960, they were made from 66 to 1970. In 65 they made the first Canon Pelix and 66 was the first Pelix QL. The QL here stands for quick load. It was the first camera to employ what Canon called a pellicle mirror as a beam splitter. In 2010 Sony replaced the legacy DSLR design with SLT cameras they called them single lens translucent. Same idea. In most digital single lens reflex cameras, um, you have a mirror that moves out of the way when you take a picture and moves back into position when the picture is over. That's a lot of extra mechanical work and of course it has some disadvantages, um, mostly mirror bounce and some others. With a mirror that doesn't move and you see through it, those problems are eliminated. Uh, and I thought this was the way that all cameras should be. Turns out there are some disadvantages, which at the time when these came out, I didn't know about the disadvantages. I just thought this was the greatest camera since sliced white bread. Now about these mirrors. Stationary semi-transparent pellicle reflex mirror. Sometimes called a see-through mirror or surveillance mirror or transparent or one-way and two-way mirrors. They come with all kinds of names. Let me take the lens off. take a look inside. There you see the mirror. And when you take a picture with this, I'll uh, put it on a, a one second exposure. You'll notice the mirror did not move because it never moves. So you don't ever have any of that kind of vibration. Now it turns out that the, the shutter in this wing makes plenty of vibration all by itself. So what happens is about two-thirds of the light from the lens passes directly through the mirror onto the film plane while the rest is reflected up into the viewfinder. The mirror itself is ultra-thin uh, 0.02 millimeters of mylar film with a vapor-deposited semi-reflective layer. The advantages are um, because of the mirror not moving, it's simpler construction, less noisy, less vibration, and there's no finder blackout when you're taking an, expo an exposure. The shutter, there's no shutter lag because of waiting for the mirror. So in reality, you could take faster frames per second. Now this particular camera, since it's manual with a crank, that wouldn't be an advantage. But later, Canon did make a uh, special version called the Canon F1 high speed, which also had the pellicle mirror, which did nine frames per second in 1972, which was pretty good in 1972. The disadvantage of the mirror, like this, the pellicle mirror, is that you have a one-fourth stop less exposure, you have a 1.7 uh, dimmer viewfinder view, so it's a little dimmer in the viewfinder, but if you compare it side by side with a standard single lens reflex, you really can't notice much difference. The uh, shutter exposed to light constantly, if, you, if you're out shooting with this, the, um, the light that comes through the lens always goes through the mirror and it always hits the shutter. Even though the shutter is closed, it's not going to affect your film. But the danger of that is if you just set it down and it's pointed at the sun, the sun will actually try to burn a hole through the shutter. Consequently, in this model, Canon made all of the shutters were metal shutters instead of, um, instead of cloth shutters. Also, light coming through the viewfinder from the back could expose the film because the mirror is always there 
and it's and it's uh, when you take a picture, the mirror, the light would come through the back, and then possibly fog the film. So because of that, they have an extra switch to close the uh, shutter blind. And then the last big disadvantage, um, and it's the biggest one really, especially for if you were looking for an old used Canon Pelix, is the mirror is very fragile. So when the mirror gets dirty, it's very difficult to clean. It would be, if you just send it to a regular camera repair shop and they weren't familiar with Canon Pelix mirrors, they may ruin your mirror trying to clean it. You may ruin it yourself. People have done it themselves successfully, but um, this one's very dirty and I wouldn't dare clean it. This camera featured the much expected at the time in 1965 and 66 uh, through the lens exposure metering facility. I'll show you that in a minute, but um, perhaps you can get it on the video here. I'll also take some still pictures, but when you press this uh, self-timer lever, if you push it all the way around like this, it's a normal self-timer, but if you push it in, it raises the CDS cell up to take a mirror to take a meter reading. You can you might be able to see that in the video. This little lever here can lock that in position, so you could push it up and lock it, and it'll stay taking that meter reading. And then you can press that and release it. So if you want to fix it, so it keeps taking the meter reading. Of course, when you go to take the picture, um, it won't allow that because the the CDS cell, which is popped up there in the way, has to get out of the way. So it won't let me take a picture with it locked up. Okay, let me put the lens back on. You put it in like this, but the lens doesn't really turn, just this big knurled knob on the outside locks it down. So it fits into the flanges, but it doesn't really twist. You just lock it in with this ring, which actually makes it super easy to take off. Little twist, it's off. Little twist, it's on. You don't be twisting the lens. Now, this particular lens, and this is the lens that shipped with the camera, has an auto mode and a manual mode. Uh, the difference is, in manual mode, when you look through the viewfinder, you'll always see the stop down image. Uh, so if you're on um, f16, for instance, which is the slowest and the smallest aperture on this camera, then it would be very dark when you look through the viewfinder if you're in manual mode. But if you're in auto mode, it'll stay open at um, f1.8 and then stop down when you actually take the exposure. Okay, let's take a look at the top. On top here's the shutter speed dial and then inside the shutter speed dial in these two little windows is where you set the, um, the ISO or the ASA. You just lift this ring up and twist it to change that setting. This is a lock for the shutter. It's a standard uh, threaded shutter release. Film advance. I should probably put it on something other than one second. Here's the sync port for electronic flash. And on the bottom, well, back up here again, um, this dial on the outside of the rewind knob is has two purposes. If you turn it this way, it's a battery test and you can see the needle deflect when you're looking through the viewfinder if you do that. And then this little white and little black spot is for closing the shutter on the viewfinder so that you can't get light through the back of it if you had this on a tripod and we're taking pictures in the daytime. So when you turn it that way, it closes the viewfinder up. You might be able to see that on camera. Okay, we'll leave it in its normal position of open. And then on the bottom, there's the rewind button, and here's the lock for the film back. It, um, you turn it to the left, and it pops open the film back. Here's the quick load system. It really is pretty clever. Here's an old roll of film. Let's try this. We'll just stick this in. You bring it over to this red indicator, and then as you close the back, that little thing pops in, closes it up, and then you take three pictures, 
and you've loaded the film. Now the next one will be film position one or exposure number one. And I can open it with this since it's just a, a junk roll of film, I can open it with the film in there. And you'll see that, so that quick load mechanism was really nice. I'll take that roll of film out. Of course, I should be cranking this with the back shot, but I want to save this roll for practice. Pretty cool. Pretty cool little camera. It takes uh, 1.3 volt mercury cells. Um, again, you can put uh, 1.4 volt hearing aid batteries in it and they'll work as well. And 1.5 volt batteries. Your meter readings are probably off if you do that. So you really have to hunt down the correct cell if you want to get accurate meter readings. Uh, battery compartments over here. The sync speed on this is uh, 1 60th of a second. And on the... Um, Shutter speed dial, of course you could select the 60th of a second and that would work, but if you turn it all the way over past the 1 1,000th to the X, that will actually force it to be a 1 60th of a second exposure and do X sync. So that's about it. Real nice little camera. So thanks a lot for watching guys, and I hope you enjoy the video. Here's a shameless plug for my book. It's called One Town Kid. You can find it on Amazon, also in Apple's bookstore, and Barnes & Noble's Nook, and the Kobo bookstore, all of the major places that have ebooks. They are asking $4 a piece. If you wanted a hard copy, um, you have to go to lulu.com, where they're $10 a piece for black and white, or $20 if you wanted color. Frankly, I don't think color adds much value. I've never made any real money on these books. I've given away quite a few and I've sold most of them to friends at cost. If you did buy one on Amazon, uh, I would make approximately $1.42 per book. Right now my total sales are about 40 books, so it's more a case of sharing than it is marketing. Thanks a lot for watching. See you later.